Paul has, in the first chapter, given thanks for the church in Colossae. He has then um, spoken of the preeminence of Christ, uh, and he now comes to um, address uh, the issues uh, that are facing the church in Colossae in this second uh, chapter. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you die to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations or rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. These things have indeed an appearance of wisdom. In promoting self-made religion, and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence 
of the flesh. Amen. The year is 62 AD, or thereabouts. Paul, the great apostle to the Gentiles, is in prison in Rome. But as he reminds uh, the Philippians, the gospel is not chained. And as Paul is confined in Rome uh, under uh, house arrest, he remembers the church where she is, uh, the church that has been founded during his three missionary journeys, but also he has a consciousness of other churches that have been formed uh, outside and apart from his direct ministry. And the church at Colossae is one of those churches. We do not know the exact details of how the church began there, but um, the best suggestion or the best guess seems to be that Epaphroditus was in Ephesus, where Paul had preached for a significant period. He was converted there and then took the gospel back to Colossae. And a church began in Colossae. The church then, as now, is never without her problems. The church in Corinth was plagued by immorality and pride and various other sins. And the church at Colossae is facing false teaching. And so Paul writes this letter from Rome to the church in Colossae. Epaphroditus has come to visit him and of course through his visit he hears and gains first-hand knowledge uh, of uh, the church. The good things that are happening, their faith and their love, their loyalty to Christ, but also the pressures that are upon them from false teaching that is happening uh, from a group who say we know far more than Paul of God. We know far more of Jesus Christ. We know more by going beyond Christ uh, and getting involved in um, mysticism and mystery. And so Paul writes this letter into uh, that context. And the theme of our sermon this morning is... Uh, an attempt to sum up um, Colossians chapter 2, where Paul uh, writes in verse 10, uh, for, uh, verse 9, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, that's in Christ, all of divinity is encapsulated in the man Jesus, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Complete in Christ. That's the theme that we want to take from this chapter uh, this morning. Uh, Paul is responding here to these super apostles, this group that claim to have knowledge and insight beyond the apostles and apart from uh, Christ. We don't know a lot about the exact details of this heresy, but Paul realizes this is poison to the church and the people of God individually uh, at uh, Colossae. And so Paul, what does he do over against it? Well, he doesn't um, set out this false teaching, um, as it were, like a tree with all its branches, with all its twigs, with all its leaves, and then take them apart. Um, Paul would be quite capable of doing that. But he goes for a much better approach, one which the Spirit of God um, directed him to which is instead of dissecting the false teaching, was to elevate Christ, the truth. 
And so this morning, as we look at this chapter, we want to cover it under three headings. We want to think, first of all, about fullness in Christ. Because that's one of the things Paul emphasizes to uh, the church and over against these false teachers. Brethren, remember, you have fullness in Christ. And when you have fullness, you cannot add to that. When you uh, fill a basin with water, it is full. Uh, and there's not more, there's nothing new that can be added and contained in that basin. And so Paul says, verses 1 to 10, you have fullness in Christ. Paul has a deep concern for this church, though he has never met them or had any previous spiritual dealings with them. He writes chapter 2 verse 1 of a great conflict that he has for them and those in Laodicea. Laodicea is a neighboring church in ancient Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. And daily Paul battles for them in prayer. And now he's writing this letter to them out of real deep pastoral concern for the believers of the Lycos Valley. And he feels keenly the danger. He doesn't reprimand them as he did the Galatians and the Corinthians. Things are not yet that bad in Colossae. There's not evidence of this teaching having taken a grip on the church, this false teaching. Uh, but uh, there is uh, a danger of that. It's a bit like a young child when it starts to wander from the side of its parents. It doesn't need to be scolded at that stage. It doesn't need to be disciplined at that stage. It simply needs the parent to reach out their hand and firmly bring them back to their side. And that's what Paul's doing here with the Colossians. He's reaching out and presenting Christ to them that they will be drawn back firmly and surely to Christ, that their eyes will be kept focused on Him, uh, that they will be walking close to Him, not wandering for him, from him. Verse 2, that you may be encouraged. And he wants them, verse 2, to enjoy the full knowledge of the mystery of God. Mystery, knowledge, wisdom, those are the buzzwords of this false teaching. And Paul says, if you want to find wisdom, it is in Christ. He is the wisdom of God. If you want to discover knowledge, all knowledge is in Christ. And mystery, God is revealing himself. The mystery of God, the majesty of God, the um, um, incomprehensibility of God is only revealed and addressed in the revelation of Christ. And so Paul is saying, forget these buzzwords that they're, that the super apostles, the false teachers are using and keep your focus on Christ. Paul wants them to know God as fully as God can be known this side of heaven. He doesn't want them to stumble. He doesn't want them to be ignorant. But he says that knowledge uh, is in Christ alone. In Christ alone. He rejoices to see their progress. He says in verse uh, 3, verse 4, he says... Um, verse 5, he talks about their good order, 
So the structure in this church, there is uh, teaching in this church, there's worship in this church, there's a life in this church that honors God. They're steadfast in their faith, verse 5. There's a solidity and stability about the church that encourages the apostle. But that can only be maintained and deepened further as they, verse 6, continue to walk in him. Walk in him, having been rooted in him and being built up in him and being established in the faith. Fullness of knowledge, fullness of wisdom, the fullness of the mystery of God is in Christ. And we access that by being joined to Christ, rooted in Christ, like a tree rooted in rich soil. And so then the benefits of that go up into the tree. That knowledge, that wisdom, that mystery comes into our lives by us being rooted in Christ and being built up in Him. And if they begin to wander from His side like the child from the parent, they are in immediate and grave danger. Now those advocating an enhanced religious experience apart from Christ, verse 4, they come with persuasive words. Um, but they are out, Paul says, to deceive. Indeed, they are out, verse 8, literally it is, to kidnap you. Be lest, beware lest anyone kidnap you. That's a really strong word, isn't it? Watch out, lest the teachers of this world and the religious people of this world who have uh, made some reference to Christ but don't uh, keep their focus on Christ and want to add other things to Christ, beware because they're out to kidnap you. And kidnapping you, they will take you away through philosophy and empty deceit um, according to the tradition of men and ultimately they are thinking and acting from the worldly perspective not from not according to Christ verse 8 and then here's the crescendo for in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. What a glorious, glorious statement. Christ is fully God. Christ is eternally God. Christ is equally God. Christ is God made known to us. That's the purpose of God that all this knowledge and the, the being of God that is in Christ would be made known to us through Christ alone, alone. Not Christ plus anything else, um, philosophy or mystery uh, or um, um, any other suggestion that people might have. And look at what he says then. You are complete. Or literally it is, you have been, having been made complete in him. He's the head of all principality and power. And what he's saying very simply, brethren, is this. You cannot go higher than Christ. You cannot get one or anything that is fuller than Christ. All that you need, all that I need as individuals to deal with our sin, to live the Christian life, 
to withstand a hostile world, uh, to witness for God, uh, to uh, display the holiness of God, all of that comes to us from the fullness that is in Christ. We are rooted in Him. And your great need and mine is not the latest fad to sweep the evangelical church, and there are fads that sweep the evangelical church, which say you need this or you need that in order to have a deeper, richer, fuller experience of God. Paul says that's not what we need. Your great need in mind is to understand more and more of the person of Christ. And he who he is as God. And who he is as the God man. And all that he has done for us uh, in his life and death and resurrection. So Paul answers uh, these super apostles and these people presenting knowledge and philosophy and wisdom and understanding, saying this is what you need. He says, no, no, you have all you need in Christ. And brethren, we need to remember that. We need to remember that. We have all we need in Christ. When tomorrow morning or during this week you would rather um, stay in bed, put the covers over your head because it's a challenging, demanding day that lies before you and if you could, you would want to avoid it. Remember, I have fullness in I can get out of my bed. I can throw off the blankets. I can get up. I can go out into the world. And I can do what Christ has asked me to do in the world and be what Christ has asked me to be in the world because I have fullness in Christ. Fullness of grace when I sin. Fullness of strength when I'm weak. Fullness of courage when I'm afraid. Fullness of hope when I'm prone to despair. Fullness in Christ. But then secondly, let us notice here that we have, uh, Paul goes on to speak about union with Christ. And you can imagine people asking, how does this fullness that is in Christ, how does it flow from him to me, to you, to us. That's the question that Paul is dealing with now in verses 11 to 15. And he comes as he does again and again in his letters to this theme of union with Christ. Whenever um, God works savingly in a person's life. It is the work of his Holy Spirit. It's the work of birth and spiritual life. It's where we are brought to see our sin and we're brought to see that Christ is the Savior from that sin. And that's a glorious, glorious work of God. But there's something else that the Holy Spirit is doing at that moment. The Holy Spirit is bringing us into that experience of union with Christ. A union with Christ doesn't happen at that moment. Union with Christ is an eternal feature of the Christian life. In other words, it goes back into eternity when God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit um, agreed to save people 
from all ages and all places and cultures and tongues and religious backgrounds. What we call and what the scripture calls his elect. And uh, they were given to Christ. And Christ, Paul, is now going to show everything that Christ was doing in his earthly life, Jesus of Nazareth. He was doing for those in union with him. And then as that people are born or indeed have been born, the Old Testament era, it is the basis of what Christ has done and did in his earthly life that the Old Testament elect were saved, but also it's the basis upon which we and others down through the centuries would come to know salvation. And so this theme of being joined to Christ, and of course John in his gospel uh, uses the illustration that Jesus, or records the illustration that Jesus gave. It's the illustration of the vine and the branches. The branches are joined to the vine. And so everything that, they, um, that the vine experiences, the branches experiences. So if somebody starts coming and chopping the vine, at its root, then the branches are affected by that. And that's what Paul's saying here in these verses 11 to 15. Sometimes these verses are misunderstood and people think that there's a discussion here about the mode of baptism. And you're buried uh, with him when you are baptized. These verses are not about what you and I do. These verses are about what Christ did. They're about what happened to Christ. And so they trace his earthly life through from his circumcision. Verse 11. Through to his resurrection and ascension into heaven when he was given all authority. So the whole span of Christ's life from his birth and his circumcision at eight days old until he had finished the work at the Father's right hand and the Father gave him all authority. That's the whole breadth. And Paul is saying, brothers and sisters, realize you were united with Christ in each one of those experiences that happened to him when he was circumcised. It was a circumcision that was that you were involved in as well. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Spoke of that work of the Spirit as circumcision does. Literal circumcision. Just as baptism speaks of the work of the Spirit. And then he goes on to talk about when Christ uh, uh, died and was raised again from the dead, uh, you were also raised with him. Um, God, raised, uh, who, um, God raised him from the dead. Uh, and then he goes on to apply it in verse 13. Uh, your trespasses and sins, you were in the uncircumcision of your flesh, but at that time, in principle, your salvation was secured. It was done. It was dusted. It was sealed at Calvary. Not the moment you and I repented and believed. And you see, brethren, that gives us a whole perspective of how to deal with a lack of assurance and doubt when it comes into our Christian lives. And I'm sure you've been there as I've been there and you've wondered, did I truly repent? Did I really believe? Was I just going through the motions? And if we start making the focus on ourselves, there is no end to the anxiety 
and the um, introspection that we will be taken into. There will be no peace of mind. The devil will ensure that. But you see, when we say, I believe that by grace I died with Christ. Christ died and I died with him. Christ rose and I rose with him. Christ ascended and I ascended with him. Christ sits at the right hand of the Father and today in principle you sit there with him. That's why I love to say to people I have two addresses and every believer has two addresses. <coughs> HN1 Heaven 1 and then whatever your address is here on earth. You have two birthdays. Uh, you have two families. And, and we can go on. And it comes down to this union with Christ. And brethren, how glorious this is. Because it takes the focus of me and of you, what we have done or not done, what was imperfect, no doubt, no doubt. I look back and I think of how little I understood of sin at the time I professed faith. But you see, we don't have to, we're not building upon the imperfect in you and me. What we do, we're building on the perfect that Christ did and we were there with him in those acts. Is that not solid right? Is that not reason enough to say, look folks, in the world, you can tell us all the philosophy you want. And you can come up with all the new ideas and the theories about the Gospels and about the Scriptures and everything else that you want. But here's the reality. We're dealing with reality, not with speculation, not with supposition, not with man's imagination. We're dealing with what is rock solid in Christ. You see, that's the best antidote. Keep us walking by Christ and with Christ. I am by grace through faith now as I was from eternity by God's goodness in Christ Jesus in union with him. And so Paul then uh, is speaking of this and he's reminding them of the benefits and the blessings, verses 11 through to 15. And he's saying right through to verse 15, if Christ has disarmed the principalities and powers, and he's made a public, public spectacle of them, triumphing over them, that's the reality. That's what you can do. That's what I can do. We do not have to give in to the devil and his temptations. We can say to him, in the name of Christ, as he said, get behind me, Satan. Literally to Satan. And to anyone who comes with ideas, as Peter was doing at that time, that were holy of man and not of God. Brethren, let us grasp the blessing of union with Christ. What has been united with Christ cannot be dismembered from Christ. Can't be cut off from Christ. Because it was God who made that union. And what God has joined together, man cannot separate. Let's rejoice in it. And let's allow it to uh, to, to um, Assure us that we have grace in Christ to pardon every sin. We have strength to perform every duty. We have wisdom to discern every situation. We have protection in every danger. And we have comfort in every sorrow. Our great need is not something new. Our great need is to appreciate more what is old. That brings us then thirdly this morning and finally to freedom and liberty through Christ. Fullness in Christ 
And we are brought into this fullness through our union with Christ. And that means, brethren, we have freedom. We have liberty. The liberty of Christ in this world. The Son has set you free. Jesus said, you shall be free indeed. And in the verses 16 to 23, Paul begins now to apply this uh, teaching because Paul's letters are always uh, divided in two parts usually. Doctrine first, teaching first. And then he says, now here's how it works out. Here's the difference it makes. And so that's what he's doing now in verses 16 to 23. Notice the words, therefore. Therefore. And as Ken Patterson said to you before, you've got to ask the question, what is it there for? And it's therefore to make application all to our lives. And um, if we have fullness in Christ, if we are in union with Christ, we are free from every teaching and practice that does not give preeminence to Christ. We say no. No to it. Verses 16 and 17. Paul says to these believers, some of whom will have been Jews, and the others who are not Jews will have come under Jewish influence. He says you're free from the Jewish religious calendar. Free from the Jewish religious calendar. Um, the, uh, and uh, the festivals, the new moons, the Sabbaths, he's not talking about the day set apart, the Sabbath day, but there were other days which were called Sabbaths uh, because they were ordinary days set aside at the beginning of the month and at various times in the Jewish calendar. And uh, Paul says, uh, those, what does he say about them? Uh, he says about these dates and days, and he says about the food laws and the drink laws of the Old Testament that are all laid out there in Exodus and Leviticus, he says they are shadows, shadows. Now if you see a shadow when you're walking somewhere and you see a shadow um, as you're coming to a corner, do you look for the shadow when you go around the corner? Or do you look for the substance? guarantee you're not looking for the shadow, you're looking for the person who's round that corner. And Jesus saying, the shadows, they're all away. They were shadows. To point us, to point the Old Testament believers forward to the Christ, to let them know there's a Christ coming in whom all these things will be fulfilled and their salvation will be found. But we are now in the age of the substance. So we say farewell to the shadows. To be like when you were engaged or when you were going out and dating, no doubt you had a photograph of your fiance or your girlfriend, boyfriend, you kept it in your wallet or your purse. Imagine now you're married a year, well, four weeks, in some people's case. But maybe in some other people's cases, 40 years. Now imagine sitting in the room with your husband or your wife and you keep looking at the photograph. You keep looking at the photograph. You open up your wallet. You open up your purse. And you keep looking at the photograph. You keep talking to the photograph and saying, I love you. I love you. Of course you would. But brethren, let's not look at the shadows, Paul say. The photograph. We've got the real thing. And in the New Testament, let's realize there is no religious counter. No religious counter. The Lord's Day is the only day that is set apart as a holy day. There's no Christmas, there's no Easter, there's no Good Sunday. Those have all been made up by man. Let's be clear about that. So let's not get caught up in the shadows that man makes to point to the substance. Let's keep our focus on the substance. And so often in history, in church history, it's when man loses sight of the substance that he's got to bring in the shadows and make much more of the physical and the outward to try and help see the substance. And it only clouds the substance even more. But then let's notice also they are free 
verses 18 and 19, not only from the shadows of the Old Testament, um, but also they're free from the contemporary trends in worship. There are those in Colossae, and they're engaged in the worship of God through angels. And it's a new thing. Um, and Paul says, let no one defraud you of your reward. Um, and worship of the angels, intruding into those things which he's not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, not holding fast to the head. And you see, brethren, again in our day and age, there's a fascination with worship. And it's a shadow again. And a failure to focus on the substance, on the head, on Christ. And then finally, you can work through these in your own verses 20 to 23. They're free from man-made rules. Christian church or religious people and it's true in parts of the Christian church as well love rules do this, don't do that when you have children and you're talking to them about the Lord's day and keeping the Lord's day they want a list of rules do I do this, can I do that and scripture gives us no rules apart from the ten rules the ten commandments and everything must flow either to that or from the Ten Commandments. But there were people who said, well, you can't eat this, you can't drink that, um, Paul says. Um, and um, they are um, not um, appreciating, verses 20 to 23, the good gifts that God has given. They're saying, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle there's a false asceticism. In other words, we've got to deny ourselves this food, that, um, uh, that activity, or whatever. Whereas Paul teaches us elsewhere, all things are to be enjoyed when they can be sanctified by the word and prayer. So anything you can say thank you to God for, without a troubled conscience, and know that it's something that the Word of God uh, uh, permits and is given to us and tells us is a good gift. Enjoy it. Now, not to the point of being a glutton or a drunkard or, or um, that thing consuming your life, but in its proper place. So Paul says, brethren, you have fullness in Christ. You have union with Christ so that all that he has done is yours. And this brings a liberty in Christ from what the false teachers are saying. Where they want to take you back. And they want to build things that are outward and can be uh, and uh, in worship. And they want you to follow a list of rules. He says, verse 23, those things, not one of them, are of any value against the sinful nature. It will not help you. It's Christ who will help you overcome the sinful nature. And so brethren, be encouraged. Be encouraged. You have everything in Christ that you need. But also, be challenged to stick close to Christ and to walk with Him and to walk away from everything that will take you from it. Amen.